private history lesson. Yeah. <laughs> First one of my junior year, I guess. Yeah. Like one of the junior year. Only the cool kids show up to history club. Oh yeah. Only the cool kids. <laughs> um Are you going golfing? No, this is part of my costume. Mm, you know, you wear your gloves and so Yeah. But when it comes to tanks. You only wear one gloves like this. Uh, ah! Hey Moises. We just started with Hello. I was running. Now we got two members! Yay! The reason why a couple people aren't here, I think, is because there's an ambassador meeting downstairs. Uh, that makes well, sense. We should have informed yeah. our overlord. We should have. Oh my god. Are you running? I was. Damn. With a cash, of money, with a cash box in one hand, backpack, then lunch. I fell down the stairs. What? A little bit. I tripped. I pulled a Biden and like. <laughs> up from there? Yeah, I was going up. <laughs> no, if I was going down, I'd, I'd be in a stretch right now. Yeah. We would hear like, we would hear people running outside. Oh, oh my god. Well, gracias, gracias a Dios. And you're fine. Gracias a Dios. <laughs> yeah. That was good. So, can you go by? Uh-uh. No. <laughs> Thank God. Gracias a Dios. Oh. I always thought it was gracias a Dios. <laughs> okay. So, uh, today's history club, I was in an email where it's going to do tanks, specifically mostly in the 20th, 20th century. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one was originally presented in 2022. Sorry, I have no idea what the history club Why it's Why we're in the 21st century, but we're in 2023? Well, because when it's year, when it's year one. No, don't spoil century. it. Don't spoil it. It's a history club. Why? Don't, take don't spoil it. Seconds. Don't spoil it. You should have one history club, which is a bunch of mini right. things. So what century is year zero then? First year century. Zero. First century. When it's year 100, it's the second century. You need century. a mini session of history club. It's like a tiny mini thing. Let me see. Anyway, so we're studying tanks. Um, so yeah, originally done in 2022. I decided to revamp this and represent it. As because we didn't have a topic last week to vote on, so I just chose one. We're very thankful mm -hmm. that you did this for us. Yes, I know. <laughs> okay, what do we know about tanks? They can be heavy weaponized, light, uh, they can be heavy tanks, light tanks, or medium tanks. All right, yes. They are wide. Wide? They are hard to pick, for sure. Okay, besides different sizes and like, Weapon, I guess, classification for heavy. Their armaments can range from on the thinner side to the thicker side. Yeah. Anything else? Um, they go boom. Russia currently sucks at using them. Okay. So yeah. Oh. They have like so weird designs for like some of them you can't see when you're driving, right? Yeah. They're a little funky like that. You can't get shot because while you're driving, you're a little. Oh no, not funky town. We're not going to funky. You know, you, do you know what I meant with that? I don't think so, but <laughs> good. It's, it's a good thing. Okay. Yeah, but our ideas of good and bad are very different. No. <laughs> All right. So yeah, very good things. Takes interesting enough are actually much older than 20th century. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a bag in here? I don't know, it wasn't a bag. What you guys do? History, History Club. Club. Oh, sick. Want to join us? Uh, no, I'm sorry. All right. So, other if you go back to the medieval era, before the Renaissance era, there were siege towers 
things that would protect soldiers from arrows and things and also help getting over walls. And, and so, you know, this kind of idea of protection which has, which was the main role of the tanks in the early 20th, 20th century. So let's talk about uh, the invention of the tank. Do we happen to know when the tank would have been invented? Well, like in modern time? Like in the, like, like what is considered the first like mm -hmm. tank? I believe it was in 19... Seven. No, 19... 1916 by the Brits. Very good. That is correct. What were you saying? I'm going to say 1907. I was just taking a guess. Ooh. Well, if, oh, we're, if we're talking about like armored cars, which you can imagine like a Ford Model T with the top checking off the deterrent. <laughs> armored, that's like a modern. Like they used okay. armored cars. Someone said, I'm going to put a gun on my car and then they drove it around. America. <laughs> Essentially, they, they stopped cars. It's like the gun hat. So yeah, it, uh, invention of the tank is attributed to uh, the natural development of advanced trench warfare, leading up to the 20th to World War One, where lines like rifle battalions, a lot, just a large number of men with rifles who can just send volleys of bullets, uh, which later developed into trench warfare where you dig in, you have cover, and so by the mid and late World War One, there was already trench warfare is becoming more advanced. There is a lot of use of artillery barrages, and and they there just needed to be a way to breach trenches, because thousands and thousands of soldiers would die um, in, in, in an attack that would most likely not uh, gain much territory. And so it was just the need of breaking through those trenches. Mm -hmm. Now the first, you could say, prototype of a tank is what's called Little Willie, which is this person right here. Is that why Steamboat Willie is called Steamboat Willie? I have no idea. Hold up. Steamboat Willie. Okay, oh, I'm, I'm so doing, I'm, can I propose, can I send in a history club topic to present? At the end of this. Okay, because that just gave me an idea. Um, so this is Little Willie, it's just a, a little armored vehicle with, that's on tracks, it's, whereas the armored cars use tires. So the armored cars you can only use roads on, in the mud of dirt, it would, they wouldn't go very well. It also had this wheel attachment to help with um, to help with just uh, movement as well. So that was Little Willie, um, which then came what was called the Mark I tank, which was the first proper tank that people considered invented by the British, as Moises said, um, which looks like this. This is the Mark I tank. Uh, well, would interestingly be called a male tank, as well as there are female tanks. Even um, today? Huh? Even today? No, just oh. these. See, when a, when a daddy tank and a mommy tank love each other very much. They'll blow at each other. <laughs> so, the difference between a male tank and a female tank is a male tank would have these naval guns. These are naval guns. Mm -hmm. So, like ships, the guns you see on a ship. So they put but aren't there. ships normally girls? Like she, like the, oh, the that's Titanic, just like, that's she just sunk. A tradition. So, what, that's wouldn't just, the ones with the language. ship turrets be considered female no. tanks? That would make more sense. Yeah, but that's just that's just a form of language. This is like actually. They're kind of back of their own rules. Well, everyone kind of like if you look at the history, no one really follows. <laughs> so the male tanks they have these naval guns. Interestingly, uh, it's actually they're actually asymmetrical. On one side, it's it goes out farther than the other. This is because these are naval guns, and each side has a designated loader. That's not hey! Oh, we have a downpour. Oh yeah, each that's side. Better. Each side of the, these naval guns on the tank had a designated loader side and designated uh, like shooter. I forgot the name of the shooter. The person who like actually shoots it and aims it. So the loader needs space to like have all the ammunition and like put it in. So I forgot which side it is larger, but that side is the side that has a loader on the outside. Um, but yeah, so these interestingly, the shape of these is also kind of iconic. Um, like a trapezoid. It's shaped like a trapezoid because when going over a trench, let's say it's going over a trench, there's this here, and it can draw. So if we have a trench here, mm -hmm. we have our tank here. Shaped, maybe not that steep, but shaped like this. Um, it was. So this is kind of the shape of the tank, the trapezoid. 
because when it goes over the trench, uh, the front will dip down into the trench. Did they design it like that because trench warfare was like very... Well, yeah, that was essentially how it was all aligned. So when it dips down, the front, the front of it will catch this edge because... Because um, this track's here, it will catch that edge and be able to climb over. I believe I saw a good example of that in the new all quiet on the Western Front mm -hmm. during one of the tank raids. I haven't seen that movie, but I'm sure it's good. Oh, it's pretty good. Does it have a soundtrack? Probably. It has a soundtrack. All right. So it's used in World War One. Um, here's one of the male tanks in, I guess, the city, but. Again, they're used to mostly create breakthrough to really, because what they're made to do was to be impervious to bullets, which they were. They provided protection from most rifle rounds and machine gun rounds. They did it find Germans would start throwing grenades and that would actually start damaging the armor. So they developed variants with grenade nets on the top. So if the grenade lands on it, it will bounce off. Um, they also developed pistol ports some little holes that you can just knock out and you have a little pistol, you can shoot whomever. Yeah. Like, this if a German gets right up to you, you can't shoot him with this, it was three then you can just shoot him with a pistol. Wait, who made this? Two months ago. The British. Okay. Um, oh yeah, very good at crossing trenches. But they, there were some pretty terrible conditions. So in the center of the tank, you had the exposed engine. <laughs> um, so you could, you could actually just see the engine, the pistons, not the pistons open, but you have the engine there while running. You put your hand on it. It's absolutely mm -hmm. scorch your hand. Um, and so if you notice, there are there is no suspension on this. So if you're going over a hill, you know. there's the you chance of also of the hitting the engine. Uh, I don't have any pictures of the inside, but yeah, you can very easily hit the engine. Famously, when these were demonstrating going over a steep incline in front of the King of England, <laughs> it came crashing down and went boom. And there are about, it takes about eight people to run this. Only only three people came out, the other five were knocked out because they hit their head on the inside. Um, it flipped over? Well, it was climbing up, and then after it climbed the thing, it came walk on the ground, right, when it climbs up. Um, there's also no exhaust for the engines, so the engines just, the fumes of it go out into the compartment with the crew. And then you got machine guns, and you got guns that all have their fumes coming out. You have your pistol ports, so you're just, basically breathing in fumes, mm. uh, and it gets very hot. Who, who said, yeah, it works, let's just move on? Like, who, what idiot? Desperate times require desperate measures. Um, yeah, it also had poor performance, it didn't really what do idiot? much. idiot, sorry. Well, this is the first one of many, so. I know. Yeah, um, they're only getting started. Yeah. It's like the first rocket. And so, but even though it had poor, poor performance, the men really liked it. Up until that point, all of the soldiers' morale was essentially like, they. Thought of, they thought the command only saw them as meat bags or just people to throw at the enemy. And so with this, providing protection from machine gun fire and also helping them in support, it helped with morale of them and it became very popular. So they continued to develop it. In the interwar period mm -hmm. came this famous tank, the FT-17. It looks like which, R2-G2. Yeah, it created the new standard mm -hmm. tank design, which is uh, much smaller, um, but it has uh, the two tracks on the sides, an area for the driver, to be in then a turret, an actual turret that you can turn in this that has a little tiny gun. You know, How many people go in that thing? Two. Okay. Um, and so after this tank, all the tanks use this model of the drivers are here, and then you have some guys in the turret with the turret, turret rot rotating on a gun. Um, so this was developed in 1917, and then it was continued to, to be used until the beginning of World War II. These tanks by the time World War II were kind of useless, they just go, they like <laughs> fuck up across the countryside. I mean, you can walk faster than these. It's, they're not really that great. I mean, you can see the Frenchman here. Uh, the French, French tank. Yeah, this is a French, this is a French tank. Um, <laughs> of course it was a French tank. Yeah. Um, so as a, as a tank itself, in retrospect, it's not really that great, but it did, it did, renovate the design. Also, the interwar period became a focus on mobility. This is kind of the equivalent of like when a parent has a cool car and they get one of those like little kid cars for their kid to drive around. That's kind, kind of, of what it feels like. But yeah, so it's a focus on mobility where they made more of these light tanks. Um, and so they'd be like faster going at about 25 kilometers an hour. 
uh, for the first, one of the first German tanks, or the Panzer I, I guess. Um, and creating more specialized armaments and equipment. No longer were they using naval guns, they actually were using proper turrets made specifically for that tank. And creating more equipment and all that. Here's a later, is a Czech tank, um, which doesn't look that bad. No. What's interesting was the Germans didn't have that many tanks in the invasion of uh, France, and so actually some quite a significant number of their tanks were captured Czech tanks. Mm -hmm. um, so continuing on tanks in World War II. Um, again, so early tanks were very light tanks. This was the Panzer I, again, made, able to move very fast and help support the infantry and also make breakthroughs. Um, and as the war went on, they developed larger, more heavily armored tanks. And with that, intr the introduction of proper anti-tank guns. In World War I, they had these anti-tank rifles, these <coughs> absolutely like, huge things, um, where it just fires a really big bullet. But now they have actual like, artillery pieces specialized in uh, puncturing tank armor. Moving into kind of how... Nikita! Hey, go. What's up, fellas? What's up? We missed the first half. Damn. So moving into European environments, which was, I guess, the, the environment it was grown in, which is mostly, if you think about West and Eastern Europe, is flat and Northern Europe, that is, flat, so not quite Scandinavia, like Germany, France, Russia, Poland. So it's flat, very small hills, some forests. There are the Alps, Alps though. There are the Alps. Um, the tanks did not do well in Italy, or at least German ones. Um, but, you know, flat areas, small hills, are really the ideal place for tanks, especially in cross-country terrain, to move across really quickly. Um, which, so in Europe, the tanks were a, a good weapon. Um, and this also came with the use of tank divisions. The, especially the Germans, they had created entire divisions specialized for tanks, um, which other armies soon developed and copied. How many people fit in those? Um, it would be about five. Wait, so less people go in that one than went in the first one. That looks like it was smaller. Yeah, that one was like super small. Yeah. This one has five people. You have two people in the front and then three in the turret. Um, you know, you talk about the role. So we have two drivers who drive. One's the driver, one's the assistant driver. If one driver gets tired, the other one can also drive. In the turret, you have the commander. You have the aim. The Gunner and the loader, you know, as I guess I costume as a loader with a loading mitt or a mock oh, of a loading mitt. Yeah. Um, in British tanks, the loader was also the radio operator who would operate the radio and all that, so one hand free, I guess, because this you can't really be dexterous with it. But it's so that after you fire a shell, you can grab it with your hand. It's a burning hot shell because you just fired a tank shell with it, and then you can dispose of it and then put in a new one. Where you dispose of it? Um, I think there are some tanks that have compartments for that, or I think you could just eject them out of the tank. Now, Africa is a bit of a different story, um, where, I mean, it came more tank-focused warfare. Traditionally in Europe, artillery and air power were the dominating forces. Artillery was the most out of all of them, of just bombarding places and, and uh, other units. But there came a lot of logistical issues, getting fuel and water and also food to the troops, but mostly fuel to the tanks was quite difficult. In, in the North African campaign, the British sunk a lot of German tankers, bringing oil from Europe down to North Africa, which starved the German tanks of fuel. Um, and there's also the issue of camouflage. It can be really hard to camouflage these tanks. Um, in Europe, they developed a lot of meshes to camouflage a tank like a bush. You could put this thing over the tank and it looks like a bush, like a big bush. Which you're like, it's a moving like bush. A big moving bush, yeah. Maybe they should have disguised it as an elephant. In Europe? <laughs> in Europe? No, in Africa. Oh, actually, that might work. Um, but in yeah, it's like those things in Star Wars that are like. AT-AT. Yeah. Yeah. They're like tiny, that. like squatter. Yeah. But, um, AT. well, in <laughs> Europe, it's like the tank's not moving, it's like a plane going by. You'll, hear, you'll probably hear the plane going by. You can just stop. And it's like the plane first will see, okay, there's trees, some bushes, some more bushes. Any of them could be tanks, really. In Africa, if you use the, if you use the bush, and you're sitting there, and you see sand and desert, and then you see a bush <laughs> out of nowhere. And it's like, well, why don't they just paint them sand colored? Well, 
they did, but see, when the desert, the sand can reflect the light, and the pilots are really high up, they're close up to the sun, so their pupils will be really dilated. So any shadows seen on the ground will be really, really dark, because their eyes are taking in much less light. So any shadow that's cast by the tanks will be very visible to see. So we just don't have shadows somehow? Yeah, you can. Um, now also, in Asian environments in World War II, there's a lot of mobility issues, especially like in South China or in Malaysia, or in Indonesia even. There are a lot of jungles, so it can be very hard to move through these environments, right? Especially with like the medium tanks. If you look at the Japanese tanks, they're really small. They don't take as much. They don't take up as much space, and they have a lot of tools equipped to, um, to maybe having crew like cut through the jungle, cut through whatever they need to do. Um, also, transportation is a big issue, especially in like the Asian Pacific. We have fighting, especially with the Americans on small islands, and so getting the tanks there can be an issue, which led to the development of what are called amphibious tanks and troop transports, right? What was nicknamed short Am tanks and Am tracks. So were Am tracks Huh? Well, there's a train line called Amtrak. Oh no, it's, it's different. But like, do you think it had any inspiration? No, no I don't think so. Um, but essentially, these were tanks that could sail all, on the water. They kind of work similar to jet skis, at least most of these, most models. We have water that comes in through the bottom and it shoots it out through the back to create the, the propulsion. So instead of landing on the beaches with the transport ships, or the landing the landing crafts, you can you'd be a mile out, and with the tanks and also your Amtraks, the Amtraks carried a lot of soldiers. You can then start sailing through on these amphibious machines of war on, onto whatever island you need to assault. Um, sure. Then after World War II came some Cold War developments, um, more <coughs> advanced armor designs. This one's a specific Swedish one which has an extremely sharp angled angle armor. So in World War II, yeah, everyone, know, everyone know about the Tiger, the German Tiger? Mm -hmm. That's one of the most famous tanks. That had like, I believe six inches of armor, but straight on, so the angle like this, which would be very hard to penetrate um, until a few years after it was developed. Um, but this one, this has about less than an inch of armor, I'm pretty sure, but because it's at such an angle, yeah. Is the modern armor way more effective than the previous armor? Um, yeah, they have more like modern material and as well. So if we have armor like this, right, it's angled, it's not that thick. Let's say it's like that thick. We have a shell that comes in at this angle. Now the shell is to penetrate this amount of armor, which is much thicker than is actually manufactured because it's so slanted. Whereas if it you know, came from straight, it only has to go through this amount. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it builds with Yeah, it's much easier to make a ship. Um, and so with this specific tank, it was a Swedish tank that went in the Cold War. Specifically, if the Soviet Union invaded Finland and also decided to go to Sweden, where you have this fixed turret where it can, it can hold an angle, shoot some shots, and if it needs to retreat, there's actually a driver in the back and the driver in the front. So the driver in the front switches control to the driver in the back, and the driver in the back drives forward or backward, I guess, relatively, to get away from the superior tanks. Also came a focus of tank destroyers, uh, where in World War II, tanks were mostly for um, supporting the infantry or creating attacks and breakthrough, whereas now tanks more uh, take the role of tank destroyers, destroying other tanks to sort of help free up the infantry. Um, also again, large, former larger guns, armor, and engines, more advanced as well. Um, this game also <laughs> split from anti-tank. I thought that was the tank itself, I was like, that's a funny game. No, this is an anti-tank gun, specifically a 105 millimeter gun. Um, so anti-tank versus tank destroyer. There was actually a debate um, in the United States to either invest more in anti-tank anti-tank capabilities or tank destroyers. Um, yeah, essentially. Because the Soviet Union had far more tanks than the US, at least that's what the US knew. Um, 
And so they needed to know whether to combat these with anti-tank guns or actual tanks. Now, anti-tank guns are actually really cheap, because all you need is just the gun and some wheels to put it on, right? And you can just have the crew train to shoot this. Whereas with the tank, you need the engine, you need the tracks, you need to get the transmission, you need to actually train these people how to use it properly. All these, and also, don't forget the computers now that you can put in the tanks to stabilize the guns, going over hills, all of these things like that. Why isn't it 100? Why 100 and 5? I don't know. The Jerry's are after us. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Um, and, but yeah, this is mostly fueled by the fear of the Soviet invasion. The, the tank lobbyists won overall because they had more money. Um, and so from then on, the US Army to combat the Soviet tanks was to build more tanks themselves with better guns. Um, but yeah, massive gap in tanks. The USSR had far more than the US. Moving into some historical tanks. Anyone recognize this? Oh, uh, yes. The Pan Hooser? Yeah. So this is. The oh, that's a tiger. Wait. No, that's a yeah, tiger. Yeah. Yeah. So I built one of those. Oh. You built one of those? I can build one. Oh, you built one? Like a model? No. No, you built one. Do you still build models? So yeah, this one's the, the infamous tiger. It's probably the most iconic. Are those like top ones? Where? On the, no, on the top of the shirt, like yeah, yeah there is. These? Yeah. Those are some of the suffering you get the nuts. Smoke um, launchers? Do you like launch grenades or smoke? But like there's too many fumes in here, like just bend them? No, 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 like an actual like, it was smoke grenade, like just generates yeah. smoke oh. to like fly in the enemy. Okay. So it's just like we're being shot at too much, let's throw some smoke and then So they went from we can barely fit the engine to like let's launch smoke at people. Well, yeah. well, this is like 30 years later. The engine's in the way back. But yeah, um, so you see all these tracks. You see these extra tracks here in the front. Why would you put these extra tracks in the front? So if like you're going up or downhill, you're not like stuck with some mass in front of you, so it just rolls like the others? No. In case the tracks break. Yeah, that's why they have spare tracks. But why put them in the front here? Extra armor. Yeah. Yeah. If you get shot, and you have extra tracks, why just put them here? This extra weight might as well be extra armor. Oh, I thought those things actually spun. No. No, um, they're facing this way. Does anyone know also who made this tank? Anyone know who BMW. made it? BMW. No, Volkswagen. Mercedes. No. You're, you're very close though. Volkswagen. Ford. No. Uh, uh, Porsche. Yeah. Oh. Porsche made this tank. <laughs> and they need a little light. Oh, no. Oh, oh, that is. All right. <laughs> Probably the most important tank of World War II. It, um, it was a tank produced by the Soviet Union in order to combat the German Tigers. They were made so that they're really cheap. Yeah. Like the so they can catch the things. Yeah. Um, interesting thing, these were also terrible conditions. A lot of crew members would actually get, if you're like in a turret, and the you know, turrets you move. You kind of can't even fit in the thing. Yeah, but the ground didn't move, and so as you're moving, you can get your and say get your foot stuck in it and then you just twist your ankle and it just breaks all these it's really big bad yeah yeah and and i just spoiler alert not good to break up yeah. the bone <laughs> the interesting thing is do not recommend in the siege of leningrad when leningrad or st petersburg is still now the factory workers had to build these tanks and famously they're unpainted and then the factory yeah. workers had to crew these tanks to combat the germans um Hey, Sherry, back up. Give Magnus some room. Yeah, that's most of it. Notice, even when it's not formal, he does sources. My critics yeah. take notes. Okay. All right. Quick read. Um, hey. Sterling engine. Sterling engine. Force. Vote for Japanese war regression. Raise your hand. No one. Okay. Sterling engine. Sterling. It's S T E R L I N G. There's different Sterlings. That's, that's fair, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Gunpowder. Alright, buddies. Go away. Have a lovely afternoon. Who won?